Hello everyone, this is Deborah Richardson and today I am putting the AP in Happy where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. This podcast will give a voice to accounts payable team members by talking about the growing reality of cyber attacks in their world and which vendor setup and vendor management techniques they can apply to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Visit the Vendor Process Training Center to enroll in your choice of 55 plus training sessions that will help you and your team avoid fraud, compliance fines, and bad vendor data. Or just sign up to get access to Vendor Process FAQs and to attend weekly drop-in live Q&A sessions. Visit training.deborahrrichardson.com today. The link will be in the show notes. Yes, it's more efficient and it costs less, but there are at least four reasons why you may not want to convert your check payment method vendors to ACH payment method. Also, if you want more information on the conversion that I recommend, keep listening. Welcome to episode 206. Are you converting your check payment vendors to ACH? Four reasons you may want to rethink. So I already know when I said uh, four reasons you might want to rethink converting your check vendor or check payment vendors to ACH, everyone, including you, probably stared at your phone or device or whatever you are listening to this podcast on and probably just think I've gone crazy. Uh, And maybe some of you not, though, because when you hear the four reasons why, um, at least to me, it makes some sense to at least consider. So we're going to get into those four reasons. And then I am going to tell you what I would recommend instead and then give you some uh, a resource or someplace that you can um, uh, get more information on that. So stick around to the end for that. All right. So I know in the past 24 months, probably it's more than that now, because at the time of the publication of this podcast, it is uh, September uh, 29th, 2022. And so we've been more than two years into uh, the pandemic. And as uh, I recently heard, I guess the pandemic is over now. Um, But in any event, I know of the past uh, 24 months and more, especially March of 2020, April of 2020, there were a lot of initiatives in corporate offices and the AP teams and the vendor teams to convert those check payment vendors uh, who you were having difficulty generating those checks in a required Uh, uh, remote work environment. And I know a lot of you came up with some creative ways to get those checks signed. I talked about them in a few, uh, in a few episodes before, but converting those check payment vendors to ACH was top of mind to eliminate the hassle that uh, went with uh, generating those check payments and also with the vendors getting those check payments as well because they weren't in their offices either. And I just heard some stories. Uh, I love talking to AP folks or AP teams because everyone has some type of a story that uh, during the pandemic that things were happening that I had no idea. And so one of them was that those folks that could go into office buildings that were like shared with other uh, businesses, they were stealing, right? Uh, There were instances where checks and other mail was being stolen because the other businesses were not in the office to uh, to collect them. So lots of reasons why you want to get away from those check payment methods and not just the fact that it's the pandemic, even before then, right? You wanted to get rid of checks because uh, they are time consuming, right? You have to um, 
generate the check. Someone has to be there to uh, put the check into the check printer. This is assuming you're not uh, outsourcing, right? So you have to get the checks. You have to put them in the check printer. Do not put them in upside down. And I think I revealed before on this podcast that that actually did happen a time or two. Also issues with the check printer, right? Um, I went downstairs and my supervisor showed me a picture that they had put on the, this, you know, gigantic printer that my company had invested in. And they had a picture of Bob Marley on it because she said, the printer be jamming, right? Because so there's there's issues with the printer too. So you have to deal with all of that. And all of that is manual um, outside of the cost of the maintenance. But that's really uh, just a manual process. And then you have to put controls in place because once you uh, generate the checks, now you have to make sure that no fraud occurs in between the time of when that check is uh, printed to when it gets into the hands of uh, whatever service is going to deliver it to your uh, vendor. And so you've got all the manual processes around that. And then you also have the costs involved. You uh, you have the cost of the checks. And then I talked before, uh, you've got the cost of the maintenance of the check printer plus the Micker Ink. And so everyone understands, right, increases the cost of generating that payment versus an ACH payment where you don't need checks, you do not need manual labor. All you have to do is generate that pay file. Now I am oversimplifying how easy it is to generate that pay file. If any of you listening have ever done that, you know that it can be a challenge. Uh, The pay file itself uh, before, like if you have a new account, you have to test that, set it up correctly, test it between you and the bank or use some middleware and do testing in that. Uh, Plus you can have pay files uh, for not just one pay file for an ACH, but you uh, may have to have it for different countries. You may have to have uh, different pay files based on currency. So it's not as easy as it as I made it out to be, but uh, it is uh, easier than and less costly. Uh, It's still some manual work, but it's not physical manual work in generating those ACH payments. Oh, and another reason that I know uh, you guys want to uh, convert from check payment method to ACH is just if you have a return payment. So if you have a return payment for a check, now you have to take that physical check, you have to uh, avoid it, and then you have to go and find the right address and uh, send that check back out again. So it's a lot of rework. Now, not that it's not some rework with the returned ACH payments. It is because you'll get uh, a notice from the bank and, uh, or if the payment just failed altogether, you just get that back and now you have to deal with that as well, but at least you don't have a physical, uh, check to deal with. So let's talk about then four reasons why you might want to th- rethink converting those check payment vendors to ACH. Now, don't get me wrong. I am all for converting your check payment vendors, but not to ACH. And so here's four reasons uh, why. The first one is, um, and probably the biggest one is that ACH payments require the collection and update of vendor banking details and also the maintenance of those bank, uh, banking details uh, as well. So if you are uh, collecting those banking uh, uh, details from email, that is the highest fraud risk uh, because 15%, and maybe that doesn't sound like it's that high, um, but it is in fraud terms. But 15% of fraudulent emails get through to your inbox. And that's according to a CISO uh, that I had on episode 153. Um, his name was Casey Allen, and he said that 
uh, 85% of emails are actually stopped by your IT department or your systems team or whoever deals with your IT. They have controls in place. They have software in place. They have things that I do not understand in place. And that will eliminate 85% of all those fraudulent emails coming through. But the um, but the real big issue is the 15% that do get through, right? And so you're taking um, the collection of um, the remittance information um, for one of the highest fraud um, uh, scams out there, business email compromise. Uh, and I have some stats on that. I've, uh, I talk about, uh, every year the FBI comes out with a internet crime complaint center report, uh, and they talk about business email compromise and phishing emails. And so we know that, uh, fraudsters are target, uh, targeting accounts payable. And I also read an article that, uh, indicated that B because of all of the ransomware, and especially when it affected the pipeline here in the U.S. Uh, uh, last year, that everyone um, has doubled down on putting uh, controls in place to prevent ransomware, um, while on the business email compromise scam where they're impersonating your CEO or your vendor to get you to change your vendor banking details. Um, no one's really worked on that. And it's not a whole lot, right? I guess that your IT team can, can do, um, because it's all on social, it's all based on social engineering. Um, the fraudsters getting to you, getting to your team member and convincing you to make that fraudulent, uh, change. Uh, and so, uh, I talked about my, uh, vendor process, uh, training center where I have, right? 55 uh, trainings on vendor process. And that does include the last Thursday of every month. We talk about new frauds and how to avoid them because uh, the cyber criminals, fraudsters are always evolving. And so it really is more of a human side when we talk about accounts payable and changing vendor banking and business email compromise and social engineering. And my thought process on this is that the vendor team or whoever is dealing with vendor banking, especially when it's coming in through email, really needs more training or more than the cybersecurity awareness training because this team uh, is getting hit with these uh, fraudulent emails from fraudsters and cyber uh, cyber uh, uh, criminals that are always evolving. They are just getting smarter. Uh, and so uh, take a, a listen at episode 153. Uh, Casey Allen, he was a, C, a CISO and he did have uh, some great recommendations for conversations that you should have with your IT team. Uh, but in any event, um, ACH payments. So the first one, ACH payments require the collection and update of vendor banking details. And if you are collecting those via email, that is a high risk for fraud. And I understand everyone thinks that they can catch them, but these vendor or these cyber criminals, uh, fraudsters are getting smarter. They're actually in your vendor's email. So there's no uh, domain or no um, email address that you just need to look at the right way to figure out that is not correct. They're actually in your vendors and could be your internal team members' emails uh, as well. And so you have to put um, processes in place so that uh, controls in place so that you uh, are not, or you or your team member are not updating fraudulent um, banking and paying a cyber criminal instead of your vendor. So that was the first one. The fact that now you have to collect more vendor banking details via email. Now, if you have a vendor self-registration portal, uh, that might not be bad. And a lot of the third-party providers for those portals also do have payment solutions too. So for that one, um, you might want to uh, maybe take some other stuff into consideration with uh, features that your vendor self-registration portal may or may not have. But um, with that, you're probably in a better uh, situation or scenario than those that are collecting it via email. 
All right, so that was the first one. Uh, the second one is now you have to store that vendor banking information in your accounting system or ERP, right? Because that's how you're making those ACH payments, which brings up its own challenges because now with the vendor banking information being stored in your accounting system or ERP, your internal team members can uh, perpetrate fraud by uh, changing those banking details and rerouting those payments. Now you have, um, uh, will be susceptible to external fraud with the business email compromise and the cyber criminals and fraudsters targeting those banking details. And it's not as if they're not doing that um, with uh, checks either. It's just at a uh, lower, lower rate than the vendor banking. I do have episode 107 that goes into more detail about are you putting your vendor's banking at risk in your vendor master file? So you might want to check that one out. All right. So moving to the third reason is all of the processes that you may have to put into place now that you are increasing your fraud risk by uh, adding the banking to your accounting system or ERP uh, or collecting more of that banking from your uh, from email. And you might say, well, I'm already doing that with uh, the vendors uh, that are currently on ACH uh, payments. And that could be true, but there are still more uh, uh, validations that you need to put into place uh, that you wouldn't do with a check payment method vendor if there was a change or uh, really even uh, vendor onboarding. And so the first one is the bank branch detail validations. And not a lot of folks think about this, but when you are getting that routing number from your vendor, uh, sometimes they'll give you the address uh, and sometimes not, but you can look that up and you should look up that routing number. Not a lot of folks do. Um, but one, the routing numbers um, can be uh, isolated or restricted, as I guess is a better word, to only uh, being used for ACH payments or wire payments, not both. Some banks have the same routing number for both types, ACH and wire, and some have a different routing number for each. And the vendors don't typically always know the difference between that. So you do need to check it to make sure that you're not setting up um, banking details and then uh, uh, the payment is going to fail based on you sending an ACH and it's a wire routing number. So that's one. And then I talked about the address before and you do need to verify and enter in the address in your accounting system or ERP. And those, uh, not just the address, but also the routing numbers can, can just be uh, wrong in some of those tables in those accounting systems or ERPs. And those of you that use SAP, you know what I'm talking about because that uh, BNKA table, I think it is, where the routing number and the bank branch uh, address um, is entered into, that is always needs to be cleaned, right? Because it allows anyone to put any uh, information in there, right or wrong. There's no, uh, not necessarily a validation unless you have some integration with a third party provider. And so uh, that always needs to be cleaned up. And so now that you're increasing your ACH payment vendors, now you've got more banks that are going to be in there. Yes, some of them share banks, but you have a lot of local banks too. So you are going to be increasing those, um, those tables, which, uh, uh, have been, I don't know, just kind of a nightmare to maintain. So that's one. And then the second one is the bank account ownership validations. That's been around for a few years with EWS, the early warning um, system, and then also their resellers, including GAIAC. So those are done um, uh, just along with the bank branch detail validations. Those validations are done uh, at vendor setup and at vendor change. And so now you've got, right, an additional lookup to do. And I don't know if they still do it this way, uh, but when I was looking at them a few years back, the bank account ownership validation pricing was based on volume. And so now you're increasing your volume. And so you are increasing uh, your cost 
uh, for those validations, not just the cost, but also the time spent for your internal team members to do to do them. And the additional follow up that might be uh, required, because uh, if you don't get a match, now you have to uh, do some things um, You may have to do some additional research or you may have additional steps in place if uh, the bank account ownership validation is uh, not found or if it's found to be at risk. And then the uh, next process is that confirmation phone call. And you guys know how I feel about the confirmation phone call. I don't really think that there is anything inherently wrong with it. I just think it doesn't need to be the only thing or it shouldn't be the only thing that you do because so many times, especially if you're not personally doing those uh, confirmation phone calls, and I do run into some people who are personally doing them and they get a little offended when I talk about um, their failing. Um, But looking at um, the team members and seeing the press releases uh, about some of these um, bank uh, uh, social engineering or business email compromise uh, uh, scams that were successful where the payment was actually sent, you'll see that some of those uh, scenarios, uh, the confirmation phone call was made. And in one previous case, uh, two confirmation phone calls were made. I'll put a link to the LinkedIn article that I did uh, on that. Um, and so nothing wrong with the confirmation phone call. You just need to make sure that it's being done and that it's being validly done. And I do recommend you have a script for that. But now you do have to put that confirmation um, phone call in place. And I will say, though, that it's um, I probably shouldn't have put that one on there because um For most of my clients, and not all do it, but for most of my clients, uh, I do recommend that they uh, do a confirmation call for a check payment method, like a remittance address change as well. And so instead of calling it a a bank confirmation call, we just call it a remittance details confirmation call. So if an address is changed and, and they are a check payment method, Uh, then you call and confirm. And then the same thing with bank. But most people just do uh, the bank uh, validations. And so adding or converting your check payment vendors to ACH now increases uh, those uh, confirmation phone calls as well as the other two processes for the bank account ownership validations and the bank branch detail validations. And those are just the ones that I have, you know, you could have based on your company, your um, unique processes, you could have more uh, steps that you're going to, that you do when you have a ACH payment vendor. And then number four, uh, you may not think about this one either, but uh, NACHA. So if you have uh, ACH payments, right, that go through, that are U.S., they go through uh, the ACH network and NACHA uh, is the operating body that rules or issues rules and standards and guidance on Uh, the payments that go through uh, that ACH network or automated clearinghouse network. And so uh, NACHA comes out with these rules or operating rules periodically, and they uh, just came, uh, didn't just come out with it, but it was uh, most recently uh, effective June 30th. Uh, It's a rule that if you have 2 million or more transactions or ACH transactions uh, over a period of time. And I'll give you a link. I talked about this before too in an episode. I actually had Nacha on episode 198 and it was called a data security requirement for the vendor bank account number. Yes. Learn more from Nacha's Amy Morris. And Amy Morris uh, is a director in the uh, Nacha's operating rule department. And so she came on and she talked about the supplementing data security rule or those requirements that requires companies who have 2 million or more transactions in a year uh, to ensure that the vendor's bank account number is unreadable when it is at rest. And I did verify that that includes when it's on the invoice 
And it also includes when it's in your accounting system or ERP. Now, I don't want to panic everyone, but um, she did indicate that most times the IT team has already taken care of those uh, and that you can check with your bank to see if you meet that threshold. So if you're listening now and you think that your company may fall into that or you have a couple more miles you need to do, check out episode 107. And that episode does have some links to that natural rule. And if I were you, I would uh, go to the NACHA site, which is nacha.org, go to their ACH rules page. And at the bottom, uh, scroll down and it will allow you to sign up for their rules news alerts uh, so that you're up to date on all of the NACHA rules. They just had one related to micro entries too. And that's another one. And we did talk about that one on episode 107. But if you are with those ACH payments doing those uh, micro entries or penny tests, right, to validate uh, vendor bank account ownership where, you know, you'll have them send you a screenshot to prove that that they own the bank account that uh, you're sending, you're eventually going to send their payments to, then you might want to check out that episode as well and then look that one up. Uh, And the links to that one is in the show notes too, but that one's called the micro entries rule. Wow. So there is a lot to think about when we're talking about ACH payments and pulling in more vendors to that whole process. So just to reiterate the four things that, um, the four reasons you may want to rethink it is one, uh, the ACH payments require the collection and update of vendor banking details. And if you're doing it via email, it could be more risk. The second is you have to store that information that you just collected, their banking information and the accounting system or ERP. uh, And that comes with both internal and external fraud risk. Uh, The third one is all the processes you may have to put into place, all the validations uh, that uh, you need to do on this bank account information that you are now collecting. And then the fourth one is I initially said the natural rule, but I'm opening that to plural natural rules that you are now expanding to even more transactions. So with all of that, um, the biggest takeaway here is that they all come with um, fraud risk and compliance requirements when you are uh, making those ACH payments. And so uh, because of that, my recommendation is if you can, instead of converting those vendors to an ACH payment method from a check payment method, uh, convert them to a card program. I like them because you get that immediate right fraud protection because that comes with the the card payment. And then uh, also you're not collecting vendor bank details, especially if you are collecting them via email. Also, you are not increasing your ACH transaction. So you're not getting closer to that NACHA 2 million ACH transaction threshold where you would have to uh, secure your vendor's banking or make it unreadable at rest. And then also, if you are doing that penny test or micro entries, uh, you have less vendors that you have to um, comply with that rule for. So with that being said, um, I do have a webinar coming up with Commerce Bank. They have a commerce payments platform or solution. And so we have a webinar coming up where I will, for the first part, tell you with your manual process, collecting that vendor banking via email, I'll add some authentication techniques, internal controls, so that you have those immediate takeaways um, for what you're currently doing, and you can use those to uh, reduce the risk of fraud. Um, But then Commerce Bank will get on and they will talk about the uh, evolution and the trends of card payments and digitizing uh, your AP payments, which I think uh, is a better solution than converting uh, your check payments uh, to ACH. 
All right, some more information about the webinar. It is a live webinar and the name of it is the Evolution of Card and Payment Technologies, where we're talking about fraud prevention before and after you digitize your AP payments. It is on Wednesday, October 19th from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And if you can't make it, make sure you register anyway. And the next day you will get a link to the recording and then also to the handouts. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And if you're interested, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, register, especially if you are one of the ones that uh, started that conversion from check payment method to ACH, uh, but you've got more vendors that you were going to target in the future, it'll be great for you to attend this webinar. All right, so that was a lot today, but thanks everyone. I hope you enjoyed the 206th episode of the Putting the AP in Happy podcast, where accounts payable teams are empowered to protect the vendor master file from fraud. Don't forget to check the show notes for the links mentioned in the podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing and writing a review of my podcast on the platform that you use to listen. Stay happy. Stay happy.